Hey everybody, welcome back to Linux for Everyone and welcome home. Last week for episode 48 of the Linux for Everyone podcast, I got to speak with a legend, Brian Fox. That guy. He's the man responsible for creating the Bash Shell. He was there in the very early days of Project GNU with Richard Stallman and his grandfather created the Monopoly Man. Brian's latest project is called Orchid, and you can find it at orchid.com. And a guy with this kind of pedigree, it's something that you might want to pay attention to. It's uh, it's difficult to describe quickly, but in essence, it is another tool in the fight to keep your internet private. And in the clip coming up, we have a really, really great discussion about the erosion of privacy and privacy versus convenience and what people can do to start clawing back some of that privacy. If you want to listen to the entire episode, I do highly recommend it. It's episode 48, and you can catch it on our dedicated YouTube channel just for Linux for Everyone podcast episodes. You're at home, and you open up your computer, and you browse to a website. And as you do that, I want you to be aware that there is a company, probably your cable company, that knows your name, your address, your credit card number, probably your social security number, your phone number, and every site that you are visiting. And they're storing all this information in a relational database. So you can trust your cable provider. But what happens when a nation state comes along and steals that data? Or what happens when the inevitable hack, since every other company on the planet has been (laughs) hacked now, and every other day you get an email saying, by the way, your credit card details have been stolen. Since every company is going to hack, what happens when somebody, some nefarious bad guy hacks that? And that guy has all that stuff. And people are always saying, you know, I don't do anything bad. I don't care. I don't need privacy. I don't care about that. I'm like, really? Because you had a conversation with your granddaughter and she talked about something that happened with your cousin. And then you talk to your therapist because of COVID. You're doing it over Zoom. You really don't care if all that information is just completely public knowledge? Of course people want their privacy. <sighs> and they should stop pretending that they don't. And then they should admit that they are giving up their their privacy because they don't even perceive they're giving it up for convenience. And that's the big issue. The convenience is 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 a drug. It's a drug and it's a hard one to quit. It really is. I have I have been talking about trying to ditch Google for the last two and a half years and I can't do it. No. I take that back. I take that back. I I have not resolved to completely do it. You know, I've switched to things like Proton Mail instead of Gmail, and I've taken right. certain steps. But uh, uh, I recently switched to a Huawei P40 Pro. It is shocking to see how many apps do not function without Google Play services. They don't function, or they yeah. don't function properly. And right. the internet, the internet itself, would cease functioning without Google services. It would not work. That's true. Yeah, this increased centralization is very convenient and extraordinarily dangerous. They're, they're building into our entire life structure these single points of failure. If AWS goes down, <laughs> everybody in the United States starts crying. And the reason they cry is because they can't see Netflix, right? Like, they don't even realize this means that they can't do banking transactions. They're like, Netflix isn't working. <laughs> Facebook's down. <laughs> oh, my God. Facebook and Instagram are down. <laughs> ah! Uh, everybody goes to Twitter to complain that Facebook is down. It's hilarious. Um, okay, but but let me let me drill down a bit into this this yeah. concept of centralization versus decentralization. For people who might not be as familiar with those terms, um, let's take a, a service like Twitter. Right, that's a centralized service. A service like Mastodon, which is a Twitter alternative, is decentralized. Right, where you have all these different instances. What is the advantage to that, to having those decentralized services from a privacy so, point so of advantage, view? The, the, the first thing I had talked about was the cable service provider. They have all this information and, and it's all in one spot. That means that if they turn out to be bad guys, they can do whatever they want with all that information. That means that if the NSA five years from now decides that um, th- they want to go get you, then they will subpoena all those records because they're stored in a nice central location easily uh, 
attainable, they will subpoena all those records and they will look through every single record to see if they can find anything, the slightest thing that they can then leverage to yell at you about and make you feel terrible. If you looked up divorce attorneys, Mm -hmm. they might say, well, you were looking up divorce attorneys. Were you getting ready to get divorced at this time? What's happening? And then, you know, you might say, no, I wasn't getting ready to get divorced. And they're like, we're going to share this information with your family and talk to them. (laughs) You start thinking, this is insane. I haven't done anything at all. My friend Sally asked me if I knew a divorce attorney. There are at least three Black Mirror episodes about this. So, (laughs) yeah. You didn't have to tell me that. I already know you watched those three episodes. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) How do I know that the people running the various. instances on mastodon for example how do i know that i can trust them how do i know could i can that i can trust the people that are running uh fostodon.org where the linux for everyone account is well you shouldn't trust them you shouldn't decide that they're trustworthy just because you had a coffee with the the guy one day so then he's trustworthy no you should assume that they're untrustworthy Hmm. you should assume that everything is is uh, bad and then or evil And then you should take a look at the software to convince yourself that even when it's evil, this person can't do very evil things. Right. But if you're a person who doesn't uh, have the the technical ability to analyze that software, then what? You know, how do you make the decision on what to use? What is safe? What is secure? You know, it's a it's a great question. Uh, because if you don't have the skill set yourself, you need to rely on somebody who does have the skill set. Um, hopefully, that is somebody that you already trust in in many other ways. Maybe it's a blood relative, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something of that nature. You actually you actually have trusted before, and they've proven to be trustworthy, and they're technical, so they can tell you the answer. You know, or or it could be that you decide you're going to trust some large group of people that aren't affiliate in any way except that they have all agreed that this thing is trustworthy. Let me let me bring this all the way back around and make it personal. What are okay. you using? What social networks are you using? What phone are you using? Like what is your what's uh, in Brian Fox's bag? I will not give you too many deep details. Oh, totally fair. But I will but I will tell you the kind of normal thing that happens. Uh, I I use a Mac computer and an Apple iPhone, and I also have an Android phone. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter to me. Um, I often run Linux. I run Linux on every server process anywhere, and I often run Linux on my on my MacBook. So in my everyday life, and for uh, normal style communications like the emails you and I exchanged about setting up this podcast, yeah, um, I I use just COTS, commercial off the shelf software, commercial off the shelf hardware. There are, there are other places in my life where I care a lot about uh, OPSEC, operational security. And mm-hmm. in those places, I have devices that are not connected to a network. W- when I do need to do something that, that networks them, I, I go through a firewalled connection like uh, Orchid, for example. Okay. Okay. You're definitely probably a disciple of Edward Snowden. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exactly like, like for example... I'm doing a podcast with you, and you can see the background behind me. Yes, but if you ever do a podcast with Edward Snowden, he's you know got he's in a black room with you know just blackness around him. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. No information. Right. You can't tell the size of the room or anything. There's no information at all. Privacy is is such a serious issue, and it's it's scary how much of it is being slowly taken away from us and. I feel like we don't quite realize how serious it's getting and or privacy, we yeah. don't care, you know? Yeah, privacy awareness is a real is a real issue. Privacy awareness. And you're, this, this not caring thing, it's because, like I said, it's the convenience factor. People are like, well, I'm not going to not use Facebook. <laughs> you know what I mean? They just... That that's not one of the possibilities. I can't not use email. You know, that it's impossible, right? And and I don't ask. I'm not asking people to not use Facebook or to not use uh, their email or anything. I'm asking them to be privacy aware. Understand when you're giving up your privacy that that's what you're doing. Understand yeah. that. 
And, and if you understand that well enough, then you'll be able to make an informed decision about whether you want to do that all the time or part of the time or just for this one convenient thing, right? I mean, you, you, you can use your credit card to buy something online. People know that and they do it all the time. You can also usually have an, uh, a one-time use credit card yeah. generated for you. Yeah. Maybe that's a convenience that you might consider using, even if it takes you an extra five seconds. You know, I've lived in Europe for about three, four years, and yeah. uh, I just recently ditched my U.S. bank accounts and opened a Revolut account. And mm -hmm. they have this thing called Virtual Visa, and it is as simple as basically clicking a button and then using your fingerprint to authorize an authorization, and then you can just freeze it or kill it and generate a new one. And it's super right. easy. So yeah. you are you are generate you are generating at least a secure transaction. You're protecting uh, the 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 sanctity of your credit card number from at least that vendor that you're talking to. You yeah. know, and it's like it's like fine if you're going to take away my privacy incrementally, maybe I can put it back incrementally, right, <laughs> in different ways. What uh, in addition to using something like Orchid, what what do you think is the most privacy respecting browser? There are some browsers that um, protect you from the websites that you're browsing, but they do that by knowing the website you're browsing. <laughs> so, oh my God. <laughs> so thanks for protecting my privacy because you now know everything, right? <laughs> hmm. <sighs> um, at least use a browser that, that denies, um, by default, denies third-party cookies. For those of you who don't know what third-party cookies are, that's when... Uh, you have gone to Facebook and Facebook has given you a cookie and you're, that means you're logged into Facebook and you have a cookie from Facebook. And then you go to, oh, the New York Times. And on the New York Times, there's an ad for Facebook or something that says, you know, like this on Facebook. That little thing that showed up in that website was able to basically access this cookie in order to know who you were. Well, Brian, please say this thing. Which means the New York Times knows who came to their website, knows which Facebook user came to their website. Yeah. So yeah. you can block a third party cookie. You can say, if I'm on the New York times website, don't let any Facebook cookies leave my, my browser realm and go there. And that will cause the little widget to say, if you log into Facebook, you can like this. I'll tell you something really disturbing. I was browsing Forbes on Safari. Yeah. Safari on my MacBook Pro, which is no slouch in the hardware department. It's a very specced out machine. And it warned me that the website was making Safari unresponsive and that I should close it. And so I dug into that a little more and I found that there are between 60 and 79 third party trackers on yep. Forbes.com. And that's not an unusual yep. number for a lot of mainstream websites. And it's downright uh. scary and disgusting. People don't, people don't think about it in the way they think about their physical world. Just imagine, just imagine you're a 27 year old woman and you go to the mall and you, you walk into Lane Bryant to buy something and then you come out and you go over to the, uh, you know, the uh, ice cream store to buy an ice cream. And then this guy, and then you're walking away, right? And this guy walks up to you and he says, Hey, I saw you went into Lane Bryant, you know, and I saw you, you got an ice cream over there. You, you want to go out to dinner with me? <laughs> and, and people, people just get, you know, they're like, ah, oh, that's a nightmare. This is horrifying. That guy should go to jail. And I'm like, what do you think is happening to you every time you browse the website? <laughs>